It's October 14th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with heightened tensions between the two Koreas here on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea says it's ordered its artillery corps near the border to be fully prepared to shoot after blaming the South for allegedly flying drones over Pyongyang. South Korea's military warned any attempt to harm its people would lead to the end of the regime. The UN peacekeeping force in southern Lebanon says Israeli tanks on Sunday burst into one of its positions. Despite 40 countries jointly condemning Israel, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu urged the UN to immediately get its peacekeepers out of harm's way in southern Lebanon. SpaceX successfully launched its fifth test flight of its Starship rocket on Sunday, moving one step closer to making the rocket a fully reusable rocket system. North Korea has issued a directive to its artillery units near the border to be fully ready to shoot. The order came after Seoul and Pyongyang shared strong warnings regarding alleged lifted carrying drone incursions, which the regime accused South Korea of. Our Kim Bo-kyung reports. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula are escalating as North Korea ordered its artillery corps near the border with South Korea to be fully prepared to shoot. According to the North state-run Korean Central News Agency on Sunday, the general staff of the North Korean People's Army delivered an Operation Preparatory Directive on Saturday to artillery combined forces near the border and units assigned important firepower missions to be ready for full-scale shooting by Saturday 8 p.m. The regime's urge for readiness comes after the regime's claim of drone incursions on Friday night. Kim Yo-jong, the sister of the regime's leader, warned on Sunday that Seoul would face a horrible disaster if South Korean drones are flown again over the North's capital, pointing to how the South Korean government maintained an ambiguous stance regarding the North's accusations. Kim said that the North has no concern about who the main force of provoking the recent drone incident is and that the regime would take strong retaliatory action in case drones carrying anti-regime leaflets infiltrate the regime's territory. After Kim made a threat, the South's defense ministry released a response warning the reclusive state on Sunday that it will see the end of its regime if it causes any harm to its people. Pyongyang had claimed on Friday that Seoul sent unmanned aerial vehicles carrying propaganda leaflets to its capital on October 3rd, 9th and 10th. Along with accusations, the KCNA statement threatened Seoul of immediate action if such incursions continue. After releasing the statement, Pyongyang sent trash-carrying balloons for the 28th time. To North Korea's accusations, South Korea's Defense Minister Kim Jong-hyun denied having sent any drones across the border. But later on, the Joint Chiefs of Staff maintained an ambiguous stance, saying it could not confirm whether the North's claims of drones were true. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. A leader summit between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo may take place in the coming month. Uh, will the three sides be able to sustain their partnership based on Kemp David's spirit, even after leadership transitions in the U.S. and Japan? Our Oh Seung has more. South Korea, the United States and Japan are leaning towards holding a leader summit soon after the U.S. presidential election and multilateral summits in mid-November, according to President Yoon song yeols office. National Security Advisor Shin won said in a broadcast interview on Sunday that while a leaders' summit between the three countries is physically difficult before the APEC and G20 conferences in mid-November, there's a growing consensus that it should take place as soon as possible. This comes after US President Joe Biden proposed holding a three-way summit to build on the Camp David spirit, reflecting on their landmark meeting last year. The message was conveyed to the South Korean leader through Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Thursday, according to Yoon's office. At their Camp David summit, Yoon, Biden and then-Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida agreed to institutionalize trilateral cooperation on deterring North Korea and on other strategic areas such as economic security, supply chains and technology, as well as consult each other on regional security challenges. 
While you and the new Japanese leader Shigeru Ishiba last week agreed on furthering efforts to advance their ties, the future of the so-called Camp David mechanism depends on political leadership from all three sides. So all eyes are on the upcoming US presidential race next month. I think a lot of it is going to depend on who's in Washington, because as we've seen with Biden, he wants to help facilitate this coming together of South Korea and Japan, and I'm sure President Harris would do that too. But if Trump is president, he's going to be going at each of these countries individually over burden sharing costs, trade or whatnot, and there won't be as much of a push or a forum created from Washington to have the two leaders get together. Still, the expert is optimistic that the three countries may be compelled to maintain their partnership as long as the Russia-China-North Korea axis endures. So on the economic and the institutional isolation, I want to see some more substance. But so long as Beijing, Moscow and Pyongyang keep up their antics, I, there will be a strong uh, urge and natural coalescence among the three. Amid North Korea's continued provocations and rhetoric aimed at South Korea, the National Security Advisor shrugged off speculation that North Korea is preparing for war, asserting that Pyongyang will not start a war unless it decides to commit suicide. Saying it's best to ignore the North's recent claims that Seoul sent drones to Pyongyang, he said what Kim Jong-un fears the most are internal threats, and has likely played up the sense of threat domestically to tighten the regime's control. Regarding the possibility of North Korea conducting its seventh nuclear test, Shin forecasts that North Korea would choose a strategically favourable time that maximises impact, possibly around the time of the US presidential election. Oh Siang, Arirang News. South Korea, Australia, Japan and New Zealand, informally known as the Indo-Pacific Forum, will hold their own meeting following the NATO Defense Ministerial Meeting next week. According to multiple media outlets on Monday, representatives from the four countries will gather in Brussels to discuss measures for further cooperation with NATO as partner countries. It's the first time for the IP4 nations to have a separate meeting without the U.S. or any other NATO country. South Korean Vice Defense Minister Kim Son ho will be attending instead of the Defense Minister. President Yoon Song yeol spent six days in Southeast Asia last week, where he visited the Philippines and Singapore for state visits and Laos for this year's ASEAN summit. Let's break down the key events from that trip with our Kim Doyan here in the studio. Good morning, Doyan. Thank you for having me. So, President Yoon's trip was almost a week long. Now, where do we start? I mean, that's right. As you said, the trip consisted of three stops, but I wanted to start with Laos, the final stop, because that was a multilateral event, the ASEAN summit. Right. First, um, South Korea and ASEAN, as previously announced, elevated their dialogue, di dialogue relationship to the highest level, the mm -hmm. comprehensive strategic partnership. That's the highest, as I said, and it was previously announced, but it was officially done during the summit. So first, take a listen to the president. 이러한 최고 단계의 파트너십을 바탕으로 한국과 아세안은 새로운 미래의 역사를 함께 써 나갈 것입니다. 한국은 아세안 중시 외교를 이어가는 가운데 공동 번영의 파트너로서 전방위적이고 포괄적인 협력을 추진해 나가겠습니다. The decision came in light of the 35th anniversary since the two sides established a dialogue relationship. To put this into context, only five out of 11 nations that are in a dialogue relationship with ASEAN are at this highest level. The two sides also unveiled a joint statement detailing the enhanced cooperation. What stood out the most was the security aspect, with South Korea and the ASEAN affirming the importance of maintaining and promoting peace and stability in the South China Sea in accordance with international law. ASEAN members back President Yoon's August 15 unification doctrine, which is his policy for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula while pursuing unification based on liberal democracy. President Yoon also took other opportunities at the ASEAN summit to pressure North Korea 
At the East Asia Summit, which is a meeting of 18 nations in total, including the ASEAN members, South Korea, Japan, China, and India, and most notably Russia and the U.S., President Yoon, in front of the top diplomats of the U.S. and Russia, said that the illegal military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang is prolonging the war in Ukraine while repeating the need for denuclearization and global solidarity against North Korea's oppression of its people. On top of that, Doyan, uh, like uh, at a multilateral summit like this one, sideline bilateral summits are also an important factor. Now, it was the first time for President Yoon to sit down with the new Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba. How did that go? That's right. I mean, the sideline summit, the first one between the two leaders, only took place after nine days uh, since Ishiba's you know, uh, election. Mm -hmm. uh, first, take a listen to the two leaders on what they had to say about the bilateral relationship going forward. 특히 다가오는 2025년은 한일 국교 정상화 60주년을 맞이하는 해입니다. 양국 관계의 희망찬 미래상을 제시하고 양국 국민들이 양국 관계 도약을 체감할 수 있도록 총리님과 긴밀하게 협력해 나갔으면 합니다. I intend to carry on and further develop the greatly improved relations between our two countries, which were strengthened by former Prime Minister Kishida and yourself. I also hope to make good use of shuttle diplomacy and work closely with you, President Yoon. Despite being a short meeting at 40 minutes, it garnered a lot of attention from local media as improving the Seoul Tokyo relationship has been one of President Yoon's top agendas since he took office. And President Yoon and former Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida had enjoyed a good relationship in the past two years with the restoration of top-level diplomacy by the two. Overall, the two um, leaders agreed to build on from what was achieved so far. The two reaffirmed trilateral cooperation with the U.S. and said North Korea is to blame for the current hostility in East Asia. That's a good start under the new Japanese leadership. Now, Toyan, let's talk about the two state visits before Laos, which were Singapore and the Philippines. Walk us through the highlights. The two stops, as you said, were the Philippines and Singapore, and they were both state visits. As for the three-day trip to Singapore, the key word was economy. Mm -hmm. Among many agreements for economic cooperation, the supply chain partnership arrangement stood out the most. According to the top office, it is a bilateral upgraded version of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, and it's the first time for both nations to establish such ties. One key factor to, the, to this is that if a supply chain disruption is identified, within five days there will be an emergency response meeting between the two nations. As for the Philippines, the two sides most notably acknowledged and showed support for each other's security issues, North Korea for South Korea and the South China Sea issues for the Philippines. Take a listen to the president. In this situation, 계속 협력에 나아가기로 했습니다. Now there were economic deals forged as well including a feasibility exam for the Bataan nuclear power plant by South Korea another deal in nuclear power. This is this was the first state visit by a South Korean president in 13 years so it shows the Philippines willingness to work with South Korea going forward. Indeed all right uh, good to have you back again Doyan and thanks for the report today. Thank you for having me. The UN says Israeli tanks forced their way into one of its peacekeeping bases in southern Lebanon, with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling on UN troops to leave the region. Yi seung has the latest. The United Nations said Sunday that Israeli tanks had burst into one of its peacekeeper bases in southern Lebanon. The UN interim force in Lebanon said two Israeli tanks destroyed the main gate of the base and forced its way in. UNIFIL added that after the tanks left, shells exploded some 100 meters away, releasing smoke that sickened a number of UN personnel. 
However, Israel says Hezbollah had fired anti-tank missiles at Israeli troops who had been helping evacuate casualties under fire before backing into the Unifil post unintentionally. The Israeli military's international spokesperson stressed that it was trying to get out of harm's way, adding that the maneuver could not be considered storming a base. Following the incident, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called on the UN to immediately remove its peacekeeping force in the region. Directing a statement to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the Israeli leader said Hezbollah is using the international troops as human shields. He added that despite the Israeli Defense Forces' continued calls for a withdrawal, UNIFIL has refused to leave. Meanwhile, a fifth UN peacekeeper was shot and wounded in southern Lebanon on Saturday, although the source of the attack is unknown. The injury comes after two Indonesian peacekeepers were injured falling from an observation tower after Israeli tanks fired towards it on Thursday, while two Sri Lankan soldiers were also wounded on Friday. In response, 40 countries that have deployed their troops to UNIFIL issued a joint statement on Saturday, strongly condemning the Israeli attack on the peacekeeping force. The joint statement stressed that the role of the peacekeepers is vital in light of the heightened tensions in the region, condemning the recent series of attacks by Israel. It added that such acts must be stopped immediately and be properly investigated. South Korea is among the 40 countries that have sent troops to Lebanon. Meanwhile, more than 60 Israelis were injured in a drone attack conducted by Hezbollah in north-central Israel on Sunday, marking one of the bloodiest attacks since last October. This comes as the Iran-backed militant group said it had launched a swarm of attack drones on an Israeli infantry camp. The militants say the attack was in response to Thursday's Israeli strikes in Lebanon that killed 22 people and injured 117 others. Lee seung Arirang News. With the U.S. presidential elections less than three weeks away, polls released on Sunday show a tight race between Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris and Republican candidate Donald Trump. Since the first tele televised debate between the two last month, Harris's approval rating has dropped slightly, narrowing the gap between the two. According to a poll conducted by ABC and Ipsos on 2,631 adults nationwide from October 4th to the 8th, 50 percent favored Harris compared to Trump's 48 percent. Now, in the seven battleground states, the two candidates were tied at 49 percent. Meanwhile, in the poll conducted by NBC on 1,000 registered voters nationwide during the same period, Harris and Trump were tied at 48 percent. Now, Harris had a five percentage point lead in the same poll conducted in September. The number of female employees here in South Korea has exceeded the 10 million mark for the first time this year. According to Statistics Korea Monday, there was a monthly average of 10.15 million female salary workers from January until August. That's approximately 46% 40, of the nation's paid workforce. There was also a record 1.7 million self-employed female workers during the same period, as more women are participating in the labor force. And in other news, a captivating showcase of Korea's traditional dress, hanbok, is being presented in Insadong here in Central Seoul City. Our Ian has the story. Korea's traditional clothing, hanbok, embodies a distinct beauty. One brand that brings this beauty into everyday life is Sondaum, which means expressing one's natural beauty by preserving the distinct lines of hanbok. Sondaum's director Kim Jong Sun believes this is how hanbok's charm is maintained. So using modern fabrics, this design uniquely blends traditional knots to add distinctive points to the hair, sleeves and other elements. Whether it's everyday hanbok or traditional hanbok, there are essential elements that must remain unchanged. Hanbok is also worn in daily life, as showcased in this exhibition, which highlights both its artistic appeal and contemporary interpretations, with participation from over 30 brands. Every year, Insadong hosts a vibrant cultural, antique and art event, and this year the Hanbok Fair makes its debut as an exciting addition to the event. We are, we are here to uh, get married on uh, 19 uh, this month, and uh, we're going to uh, have a traditional wedding in Hanbok. That's really beautiful, and uh, I think that it's uh, from the past, but it's really living today. And, uh, 
This exhibition features stunning designs that capture the spirit of today's fashion while respecting tradition. And what better way to celebrate this fusion than with an exciting fashion show? Get ready to be inspired by modern hanbok designs that challenge convention and redefine style. This hanbok fashion show is a meaningful runway experience for the models, as wearing traditional Korean clothing is a special honor for them. In fact, many of them would love to wear hanbok in their everyday lives. Absolutely, yes, because who wouldn't like because um, the color is really beautiful and it's and especially it's really comfy. I heard that people don't really wear hanbok in like their daily life because it's kind of uncomfortable, but this hanbok is really comfortable. So. The Hanbok Fair, which runs until October 13th, is an event where the value and beauty of hanbok can be appreciated in various ways, and there's an opportunity to buy a hanbok as well. The female model looked beautiful in her tweed-inspired dress and made me think it would be nice to try wearing hanbok in everyday life. Adapting to modern trends could be one of the most effective ways to uphold the hanbok tradition, preserving its meaning and ensuring it remains alive for many years to come. Lee eun Arirang News. And now let's take a look at the stories from around the world with our very own Kim si Good morning, si Good morning, Dami. So Elon Musk's SpaceX saw a notable achievement over the weekend uh, with its latest Starship test flight. Uh, walk us through the highlights. Yeah, that's right, Dami. So SpaceX's fifth Starship test flight successfully uh, made uh, landing on, uh, on Sunday with the catching the returning of the first stage booster of its mega rocket using the mechanical arms mm. of its launch tower. Now, SpaceX achieved what was a world first engineering feat and a groundbreaking step towards the company's quest for rapid reusability of its rockets. The fifth Starship test launch at SpaceX's Starbase facility in Boca Chica, Texas, saw the rocket's first stage super heavy booster lift off at 7.25 a.m. local time, sending the Starship's second stage rocket towards space before it separated at an altitude of around 70 kilometers to begin its gravitational return to land. Now on the way down, the Super Heavy booster relit three of its 33 Raptor engines to control the speed of its descent back to SpaceX's Texas launch pad before the launch tower's two large mechanical arms called Mechazilla by the company's founder, Elon Musk, caught the booster, achieving what a SpaceX spokesperson called a day for the engineering history books. Now to India, where opposition Nationalist Congress Party politician Baba Siddiqui was shot dead in the country's commercial capital, Mumbai, on Saturday. According to local media reports, three gunmen shot Siddiqui four times in the chest during a festival near the office of his son, who is also a politician. 66-year-old Siddiqui, a former minister in Maharashtra state, was rushed to a hospital with hundreds of followers but died in the same evening. Local authorities said they have arrested two of the alleged shooters and are on the lookout for the third. Maharashtra state is expected to hold legislative polls next month. A man in illegal possession of a shotgun, loaded handgun, ammunition and several fake passports and driving licenses was arrested at a security checkpoint near the Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's rally in Coachella, California on Saturday. According to Riverside County Sheriff Chad Bianco, the suspect, a 49-year-old Nevada resident, identified as Vem Miller, who initially claimed to be a journalist, was stopped at a security checkpoint while driving an unregistered black SUV with a, quote, homemade fake license plate. Sheriff Bianco called the suspect a lunatic, but said the incident did not impact the safety of Trump or the rally attendees. Now, Miller was charged with two misdemeanor weapons offenses and released on a $5,000 bail on Saturday. No federal charges have been filed.
It's a cloudy start to the new week. Meanwhile, Chungcheongdo and other southern provinces will receive autumn rain starting this morning. Rain will expand to most of the southern provinces by the mid-afternoon, meaning rain gear will be needed for your evening commute. Then it will continue to rain through tomorrow, and further south, we'll see rain into tomorrow evening. It's going to rain down heavily along the coast tonight, pouring down 10 to 30 millimeters an hour with up to 80 millimeters of downpours in the forecast for southeast regions along with thunderstorms. The rest of the southern provinces could see up to 40 millimeters. There could be some sprinkles in the upper areas as well. Afternoon highs will be slightly lower than Sunday with a high of 23 degrees here in the capital. Daegu and Gwangju will be topping out at 22 degrees Celsius. Sunny skies return to central parts of Korea tomorrow, but the rain on Friday will bring chillier air to the country. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. Arirang News will be back at 5 p.m. Korea time.